Thank you. That was very generous. I didn't know he was going to take all that time. Um, I'm not going to take all that time about my three colleagues, except to say they are each terrific academics in their own right, and I'm going to save as much time as I can uh, for them. Uh, this is a review of the Supreme Court's term. Not every case the Supreme Court decides makes the front page of the New York Times, not even every important case. And even those that make the front page of the Times will mostly not make the cut for our discussion uh, today. Um, let me just give you a little bit of a smorgasbord. The Supreme Court decided two statute of limitations cases last year. They decided a restitution case under the Employee Retirement and Income Security Act. Uh, in two different cases, they made it marginally more difficult for prisoners to sue their jailers. Uh, they held that Congress can control the result in a specific case identified in the statute by docket number if it is careful to amend the applicable law and not to give instructions to the court. It's all about how you word it. Um, <clears throat> they struck down Florida's system for administering capital punishment, but they upheld capital punishment from Kansas. Um, and of course, the big story this year was the death of Justice Scalia, uh, which left the court split four to four in some important cases. Uh, four four affirms without opinion and without creating a precedent in the Supreme Court. So President Obama's immigration plan was struck down four to four without precedential effect. Most likely, instead of being struck down five to four with a potentially sweeping opinion, uh, public employee unions survive four to four instead of having much of their funding cut off. Uh, there's a case, Nevada versus Hall, that says you can sue a state in the courts of a sister state. Sovereign immunity doesn't bar that. That survived four to four, uh, probably would have been overruled. They split four to four in a case about whether wives who guarantee their husband's debts or vice versa are protected by the Equal Credit Opportunity Act. Um, the wives probably would have lost if Scalia had lived. Um, and 4-4 in a case about whether tribal courts have jurisdiction over tort suits against non-members of the tribe. Um, probably the answer would have been no if Scalia had lived. Sometimes his absence led not to a 4-4 affirmance, but to narrow opinions that duck the issue. Uh, most famously in Zubik versus Burwell involving the contraceptive mandate under the Affordable Care Act and a claim of religious nonprofits for an even broader religious exemption than the one the administration had created, um, ended in a unanimous remand that looks like a desperate request to please, please settle this case. Um, ain't going to happen. Those cases will be coming back. Um, the court did not abolish consumer standing to sue for statutory minimum recoveries. Um, probably would have if Scalia had lived, but instead issued a narrow and cryptic opinion. But what they did not do in any of these cases is set the case for re-argument next term. Uh, why not? Because it wouldn't have done any good. Uh, the court returns on Monday, uh, still has only eight justices, and will likely have only eight justices for all or most of this year. Um, some Republicans are openly talking about never confirming a Democratic nominee. Uh, but even if someone is nominated after January 20th and confirmed in due course, which seems more likely, uh, that person won't be there in time to vote on many cases, and maybe not any cases. Oral arguments end in April, um, and a three-month confirmation process would not be uh, would not be surprising or astonishing. Uh, today, we're going to focus um, more in depth on three or possibly four sets of cases. The University of Texas has been litigating about affirmative action admissions for 24 years now. Um, and Kim Ford Masrui is going to talk about the most recent installment in that litigation, Fisher versus Texas. Uh, affirmative action was upheld and um, would have been upheld even if Justice Scalia had lived, but if he had lived, it would have been presumably a 4-4 without opinion and without presidential effect. Uh, Mike Gilbert is going to talk about a collection of legislative redistricting cases from Virginia, Texas, and Arizona. Uh, cases that have enormous uh, consequences for the workings of our political system. Deborah Hellman will arrive a bit late, she's still in class, but she will talk about this term's abortion decision, uh, Whole Women's Health versus Hellerstadt. Uh, that was 5-3, so it would have come out the same way even if Justice Scalia had lived, unless he had browbeat Kennedy into changing his vote, which is probably possible. Um, <laughs> If time permits, which it probably won't, she's also going to say a bit about the reversal of Governor McDonald's conviction in uh, McDonald uh, v. United States. 
Uh, we're a little pressed for time. We will not have a question and answer session, but we will have a reception afterwards, and the panelists are, will linger, and you can an ask questions one-on-one -on -one or in small groups. Uh, so, Kim, take it away with Fisher. Thank you. Let's see. Thank you, Doug, and thank you all for being here this afternoon. I'm going to talk about Fisher versus the University of Texas II, because it came up uh, three years ago as well, uh, the same case. So this case involves Abigail Fisher suing the University of Texas in 2008 uh, because she claims that her equal protection rights were violated because she was disadvantaged in her application because she is white. In order to understand her claim and the posture of the case, you need to understand that Texas has two admissions tracks. The first is the so-called top 10% plan, and this requires the University of Texas to admit the top 10% of every high school in the state, and that fills about 75% of the class. The other track is the more individualized, holistic track, where it looks at a number of things you might expect, high school grades, SAT, community service leadership, extracurriculars, economic status, and also race. And uh, race has been used typically to the benefit of uh, black and Latino uh, applicants in this track. It's the second track that she's challenging, uh, the holistic track. She was not in the top 10% of her class. Well, she sued, it. she lost in the lower court, it came up to the Supreme Court, it sent it down three years ago to apply strict scrutiny again, it comes up to the court again. So this summer, in a four to three decision, the Supreme Court sided with the University of Texas. So the court applied strict scrutiny, so for the one L's and the three L's, <laughs> strict scrutiny <laughs> is the, the test the, the court applies to uh, determine whether uh, race-based decision-making by the government is constitutional. And it requires the government to prove that the use of race is necessary to serve some compelling governmental interest, some extremely important government goal. Uh, and in this case, University of Texas alleged and the court upheld that the use of diversity uh, was in pursuit of the compelling interest, uh, racial diversity, of prom promoting academic inquiry, breaking down stereotypes, promoting cross-racial understanding, preparing students for a diverse workplace, and preparing leaders for, uh, uh, that would create legitimacy in the eyes of the public by demonstrating that positions of power are open to people of all races. The court also accepted that race was necessary. Uh, Abigail Fisher had alleged that part of the reason it wasn't necessary is because of the top 10% plan already achieved a significant amount of diversity because many school districts were black and Latino, so the top 10% of those schools uh, generated diversity. And even in the holistic review, some of those applicants were also diverse. But the court accepted that the, court, that, um, the school had a, a, kind of a reasonable basis to believe that uh, they were not getting the diversity they needed, especially at the classroom level, uh, without actually using race as a factor in this holistic uh, review. Uh, they also, the court also said you didn't need to identify your goal with specificity, that would amount to a quota. So having a kind of ill-defined critical mass to achieve these goals was uh, acceptable to the majority. There were two dissenting opinions, one by Justice Thomas, which was short and said that the Constitution is absolutely colorblind. There was a, a very long uh, and passionate defense by Justice Alito, joined by Thomas and Scalia, that essentially said that uh, it wasn't necessary. There were all sorts of uh, things that the school had not uh, proven to show that, uh, that its use of race was yielding uh, demonstrable benefits. Uh, what are the implications, and then what do I think about the opinion? Uh, the implications are uh, significant, perhaps more so than the attention they got, because it did reaffirm the law, but uh, many observers thought the court would overturn affirmative action. So this does signal that affirmative action is safe for the time being in, in higher education. Uh, although, with the observation that the court emphasized the kind of unusual system uh, at issue here and the limited time that the university had had it in play. So it, it's not a, a broad 
a sweeping justification for affirmative action, so schools still have to be, be quite careful. But given that Kennedy has been the swing vote, this signals that uh, uh, even if uh, the Republican wins and a Republican is appointed, uh, affirmative action in a limited respect will be upheld. If a liberal gets appointed, then uh, affirmative action would be even on safer ground uh, for the foreseeable future. What do I think about the case? I'm actually of mixed feelings. Uh, on the one hand, I'm pleased the court upheld it because in my assessment, race-based affirmative action is legal under the best interpretation of the Constitution. But where I have uh, disappointment is a disappointment I've had uh, for several cases the court has decided in the affirmative action realm, and that is the emphasis the court plays, places on the educational benefits of affirmative action rather than justice. By justice, I mean remedying the consequences of historic racial injustice. To me, that's a much more morally compelling reason as to why our society should engage in race-based decision-making, why that is an exception to a general prohibition on taking race into account, because corrective justice views as equally important the remedying of past injustice as the injustice of that injustice. And given the uh, gravity of America's history of slavery, segregation, and discrimination, with stark disparities across practically every indicator of social and economic well-being, the moral imperative to remedy that justice is, uh, is a more compelling reason to engage in affirmative action. Uh, I have some more specific criticisms of diversity. And again, I say this with some pause because since that's the only rationale, if the court were to pay attention to me and say, okay, we're not going to uphold it on diversity anymore, I think we'd be worse the wear. Hopefully, they'd pay attention to, uh, to the entire message I'm making. So my first concern is just the fact that it's relying on a less compelling reason, diversity is educational benefits rather than justice. It means that in the long run, it's not as weighty and persuasive a justification, so affirmative action, given its admitted costs, will eventually be abandoned when it shouldn't be if the true justifiability of it were recognized. A second concern I have with uh, diversity is it's limited to settings that justice uh, would not be limited to. So diversity emphasizes viewpoints and experiences and differences in outlooks, which certainly serves a liberal education or a law school education, but it's not necessarily as obviously useful for certain fields like uh, mathematics, although we can argue about that, but it's less obviously so, and it's certainly less obvious for uh, blue collar jobs, construction, police, firefighting, uh, municipal services, uh, factories, and the like. Uh, we don't really need a diversity of viewpoints uh, in those contexts, and indeed some economists have uh, made the case that homogeneity may be useful in certain business contexts. But justice could be served to the extent many of these positions underrepresent uh, certain minorities because of our history of discrimination. So uh, diversity limits the settings in a way that undermines justice. A third concern I have with diversity, all of these are the extent to which it undermines uh, justice, not just ill served It's not just inadequate, it actually conflicts with justice. Diversity is in tension with the racial focus of affirmative action programs. Uh, and many of you have probably come across this in discussions. Well, if it's about diversity, then why are we emphasizing race when there's all sorts of diversity, which, which is true, you know, whether you're in the Peace Corps or play uh, an instrument or uh, spent time abroad or you're older, all of these contribute to diversity. Yet the affirmative action policies often emphasize race. So again, this undermines the credibility of the justification because it doesn't, uh, the programs don't seem to fit the justification and that undermines its legitimacy in the long run. Alternatively, uh, with respect to the tension with the racial focus, it encourages expanding uh, preferences to these other types of diversity which can be useful in their own, but to the detriment of emphasizing race. So either it emphasizes race without obvious justification, or it expands diversity, admissions officers or schools who say, look, we're promoting all these other kinds of diversity, that's what we're supposed to be doing, but in so doing, they're not pursuing uh, remedial justice. Uh, and my fourth and final concern with uh, diversity, and perhaps the one that troubles me the most, is that it potentially creates the illusion of justice. 
the underrepresentation of especially African Americans as well as Latinos in positions of power in our society is evidence of uh, our failure to remedy past injustice. But diversity-based programs don't ask whether someone has experienced the intergenerational effects of historic discrimination. You can fill positions with minorities who have not experienced injustice. Uh, case in point, recent immigrants. A study at Harvard, for example, showed that two-thirds of the beneficiaries of affirmative action uh, either had uh, a foreign parent and or a white parent. Now, I have nothing wrong with either of those. My mother's white and both my parents are foreign. But admitting me does not directly remedy uh, the effects of past discrimination. I have not experienced those intergenerational uh, and current day disadvantages. So I agree with some scholars that more attention should be paid to emphasize the benefits in the direction of so-called legacy uh, blacks, people who have actually experienced the intergenerational effects of slavery and segregation. Um, but it doesn't do that. And so what happens is over time we may think, oh look, we've diversified positions of privilege and power, but it's in a sense with the wrong blacks. And that may lead us to abandon efforts because we think we've succeeded when we have only uh, obscured uh, the fact that we have not achieved a just result. So I have three suggested remedies uh, for equal protection doctrine, all of which are designed to advance justice. First, the court should recognize as compelling race-based affirmative action to remedy historic discrimination. Uh, secondly, uh, as I was already uh, explaining, the court should also, uh, or, or institutions with the court's encouragement, should also tailor it more towards uh, minorities who have genuinely experienced uh, discrimination. That need not be limited to many generation blacks, but there should be some attention to what uh, how many generations you've been here, what school systems did you go to, where did you, uh, uh, where has your family been, As in, in an effort, and you know, experts could do this much better than, than I could, but an effort to try and identify with better predictive value who is likely a victim uh, of historic discrimination. And third, the court should be more tolerant of race-based policies designed to promote cross-racial empathy and understanding. Uh, diversity in higher education can certainly contribute to that, but it should be broader. Uh, any context in which uh, interaction between people of different races can promote uh, cross-racial empathy should be viewed uh, positively if tailored uh, carefully. Uh, one example, uh, and perhaps the best uh, setting, would be in primary and secondary education. School children are the most open to meeting people uh, across racial differences. Uh, School districts have tried this. Seattle and uh, Louisville, Kentucky, for example, engaged in uh, using race to a very limited degree, but in order to maintain a degree of integration uh, at the schools in their school districts, without any claim uh, by those who challenged the program that the, the different schools were of unequal quality. So the schools were comparable, but uh, the assignment process created a degree of racial diversity at all the schools. The Supreme Court, as many of you know, struck that down in 2007 and that was a mistake. The court should allow efforts to promote cross-racial empathy because that itself is also an inherited damage of historic discrimination. The degree of separateness and inequality in our society is part of what promotes the lack of understanding and mistrust across racial lines. Advancing justice would seek to remedy that deficit. Thank you very much. If, if I could very briefly interject, I've been caught up in the Texas litigation for much of the 24 years. Um, Justice Kennedy tried to keep this opinion narrow. He said, you know, Texas uh, has a unique plan and, uh, and Texas has this 40-page single-space document that demonstrates and explains why uh, a plan that didn't consider race would not work for them and it's not clear that anyone else can make this showing and so on and so forth. Uh, the efforts to keep it narrow, I think, will not be successful. Um, he may get reinforcements, uh, but any university that has selective admissions and does its homework can make the showing that Texas made. I think admissions officers need to be 
doing their homework and documenting that they in good faith considered race neutral means and explaining why they won't work. And I think that many universities, maybe most universities, are in fact not doing that. Uh, they're saying, we won, we're done, we can, we can go forward. They need to, uh, they need to uh, document things the way Texas had documented them. Uh, the reasons why race neutral means don't work are in fact quite generally applicable. There are additional lawsuits pending against Harvard and North Carolina, and uh, the folks who have been bringing these cases will uh, try to get as much as possible out of the limitations in Kennedy's opinion. So this fight is not over, but I agree with Kim um, that the constitutional part of it is probably over for a while unless there are a series of additional Republican appointments uh, to the court. The political fight, the possibility that legislators might interfere or limit affirmative action uh, remains quite alive. Uh, Mike Gilbert is going to talk about the legislative redistricting cases. <clears throat> Okay, thank you all very much for coming and sticking around on this dreary day. Um, 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 I'm happy to be here and to have a chance to talk to you about the court's most recent term, which as usual was interesting, important, a little bit surprising, and um, as always, a little bit maddening. My job today is just to focus on a few cases involving election law. So election law, which is also dramatically called the law of democracy, structures just about every aspect of the American political process. And as you probably know, as you can tell by looking at the headlines, election law disputes arise constantly. Um, um, and the Supreme Court is often called upon to resolve them. Some of these cases divide the justices and attract a lot of public controversy. The clearest example in this regard is a case you've probably heard of, Citizens United. This is the case in which the court, by a bare 5-4 majority, concluded that the First Amendment gives corporations a right to spend unlimited sums of money on political advertising. That was not popular when it was decided, and it remains unpopular today. Other election law disputes um, uh, are not so high profile. They're deeply important, but they don't get as much attention. As Professor Laycock said at the outset, they don't necessarily make New York Times headlines. One kind of election law case that falls in this category is a districting case, or cases about districting. So some of you know all this, but just for those who don't, districting is the process by which voters are sorted into individual districts for purposes of casting their ballots and electing representatives. So just to be crystal clear on this point, Virginia's population entitles it to 11 seats in the U.S. House of Representatives, so uh, 11. Uh, we have 11 districts, meandering districts. The state is carved up. We're in the fifth district as we speak. And every two years, voters in each district cast their ballots and elect a uh, um, representative. Um, um, in the last term, the Supreme Court decided three cases about districting. So that's a lot. And that tells you something about the importance of the issue. And it also tells you something, perhaps surprisingly, about the fluidity of the law in this area. You might think, after two centuries of American democracy, we'd have the basics sorted. We don't. <laughs> so there are three cases here. I'll talk briefly about all three, but I'm going to concentrate my time on the first of them, a case called Evenwell, which I think is the most important among them. So first, a little bit of background. In general, states have primary responsibility for drawing district lines. So in Virginia, for example, it's the state legislators, now they need the governor's approval at the end, but it's the state legislators who draw the congressional district lines, those 11 districts I just mentioned, and it's also state legislators who draw all of their own state legislative district lines. Now you might be thinking, gee, this sounds like a conflict of interest. <laughs> it is. <laughs> So on a different day, we could have an interesting conversation about partisan gerrymandering, that is to say the drawing of district lines for political advantage. Um, um, but that's not my objective today. That's not what these cases are about. So when state legislators draw these district lines, the Constitution requires them to make them equal in size. Even well, the case from the last term basically asks this question, what exactly do we mean by equal. So historically, states have, just about every time they redistrict, uh, look to total population when they're trying to equalize their districts. So just to be clear about what this means, if we're a bunch of legislators and we're drawing district lines and we create a first district that has about 100,000 people in it, then we need all of our other districts to have about 100,000 people in them too. <laughs> 
If we don't, we uh, violate the Constitution. Now, critically, when states do this, they look just to total population. So it doesn't matter if one district is mostly men and the other one's mostly women. It doesn't matter if one district is mostly adults and the other one's mostly children. It doesn't matter if one district is all citizens and the other is mostly non-citizens. It doesn't matter if the districts are full of people like us who are free to spend a Wednesday afternoon at a lecture or people who are incarcerated and sitting behind bars. As long as the total number of people in all these districts is the same, we've satisfied the constitutional requirement. Now, the challengers and even well say, this is all wrong. The Constitution does not permit states to do it this way. In fact, they go further, the Constitution requires states not to look to total population, but voter population. So let me explain what I mean with an example, what they mean with an example. So suppose you have two districts, and there are 100 people in each one. And in the first district, all 100 people are adults who are eligible to vote. In the second district, you have 100 people, but only 10 of them are adults who are eligible to vote. The other 90 are kids or non-citizens. These are classes of people who are not entitled to vote. So with respect to total population, we're fine. 100 people in each district. But with respect to voting population, there's an enormous discrepancy. There are 100 voters in the first district, just across the aisle, just across the line, only 10. So think about the implications. If you're a voter in the first district, well, there are other, there's another 99 voters around you. With that number of people, the probability of your vote ever mattering, the probability that your vote ever actually decides an election is very low. So to attach a label to this, your voting power is quite low. Now, if you just skip to the other side of the line, now there are only 10 voters. So probabilistically, your vote is going to be decisive much more often. There's only 10 of you making the decision now, not 100. So your vote has great power. So the even well challengers are essentially saying this disparity in voting power violates the one person, one vote principle embedded in our Constitution. It violates the Equal Protection Clause. Okay, big stuff. Now, let's take half a step back from the opinion and just think about the values at stake here. Because they're big. We care in a democracy about equal voting power. But we also care about equality and representation. And one of the really interesting things about Evenwell is that it demonstrates clearly that we probably can't get both. We can get one or the other. We can't do them both at the same time. So let's just make sure you see the logic. If you do it the way states traditionally do, so we just look at total population, the way Texas did in the actual case, now you get the discrepancy in voting power. You can have the 100 voters in one district and the 10 in the next. That's bad. But here's what you gain, a certain kind of equality in representation. Every representative has about the same number of constituents. No matter which district you're in, if you're a constituent, you, at least in theory, have about the same ease or difficulty of contract, contacting your representative and hassling them and informing them and trying to get them to be responsive to you. Now, if instead of doing it in the traditional way, you do it the way the even well challengers say we should, well, we get a trade-off. We get the opposite. Now you might get the equalized voting power. So you have 100 voters in each district. But you get an inequality in representation. You can have one district that's 100 voters and nobody else. And right next door, another district that's 100 voters and 900 non-citizens. OK, would you rather be a constituent in the first district or the second? Would you rather have to compete with only 100 other people for your representative's time and attention? Or would you rather compete with 1,000 other people? So it's on the one hand, on the other. You can get the voting power right or the representation, but you can't do both. Now, in a democracy, we care about both of these things. You can go read the dusty old tomes. You will not find political theorists telling you exactly how to resolve this tension. And the Constitution doesn't either. And that's what the court concluded in Evenwell. Just to cut to the chase, the court said, we're not sure what to do. That's my interpretation. So we're going to give states the choice. If you want to keep doing what you've long been doing and district on the basis of total population, that's fine. You're not required to do what the even well challengers say. On the other hand, if you choose to do what these challenges are pushing, you can do that. States, you can try to district on the basis of total uh, voter population rather than total. Now, the opinion's a little tricky because the court doesn't say if you district on the basis of voter population, you're fine no matter what. I think that if you district on that basis, you may get another challenge and the court may say, actually, you can't do that after all. 
But at the moment, the court gives states the choice, and everybody's prediction is that states will keep doing what they've been doing. You do it on the basis of total population, in part because with respect to total population, you have data, census figures, that allow you to sort this out. If you're trying to look at voter populations, things get a lot murkier. Now, there's much more to say about Evenwell, but I have two more cases to cover, so I'll keep moving. If you have questions, please ask me afterwards. So the second case I want to talk to you about is titled Harris versus Arizona Independent Redistricting Commission. And this is another case on the question of what exactly does the law require with respect to equalization across districts. So I've been telling you so far the Constitution requires equality, at least in some sense. That's stretching it a little. The Constitution requires districts to be more or less equal in size. The exact amount of equality that's required depends on the context. So if you're talking about Virginia's 11 congressional districts or any other state's congressional districts, the Supreme Court tells us that the Constitution requires almost exact equality. So if you have a congressional district A with 725,000 people in it and congressional district B right next door with 735,000 people, doesn't sound like a big difference, odds are pretty good the Supreme Court's going to tell you that's unconstitutional. For congressional districts, we need almost exact equality. What about state legislative districts? Well, there the court gives more flexibility. All these, you know, House of Delegates, state legislative, state senate districts, they don't have to be exactly equal. They have to be, in the court's language, quote, substantially equal. Okay, you know this debate about rules and standards? <laughs> this is a standard. What do we mean by substantially equal? We've had some hints from lower courts before, some hints from the Supreme Court, and the great news coming out of the Arizona case is that now we have uh, some relative clarity from the Supreme Court. So let me quickly give you the facts of the case. In Arizona, the Districting Commission had a draft districting plan under which the maximum population deviation in district size was about 4%. So there's a little bit of math back there. I'm not going to show you the formula. Just suffice to say, ah, they're pretty equal in size, but not quite. But the District and Commission didn't accept that plan. They tore it up and went with a different plan that had a maximum population deviation, not a 4%, but 9%. So they're less equal. And what's more, there was quite a lot of evidence that this new districting plan was intentionally designed to favor Democrats at the expense of Republicans. Remember that mention of partisan gerrymandering? They both do it, by the way. So liberals don't feel bad. It's across the board. <laughs> okay, so some challengers said, this is not okay. The 9% deviation is not substantially equal. The district and commission should have gone with the other plan, which only had a 4% difference. And the Supreme Court weighed in and said, no, actually, this is okay. Uh, you don't have to take notes here, but here's the basic rule. As long as the maximum population deviation is... 10% or less, then the courts are going to say that's substantially equal. That's okay, unless some challenger can show up and prove, or at least provide evidence showing, that it's more likely than not that some illegitimate criteria were used to draw these district lines. So what's the idea here? here, here again, my interpretation. Here's what the court has in mind. We want these districts to be more or less equal. But we also want to give states some flexibility. See, you don't want states to, in the interest of getting every district exactly equal in size, slice the city of Charlottesville into three pieces. You don't want them, in the interest of getting districts exactly equal in size, uh, carve a Native American reservation into six pieces. You want to give them a little room. So legitimate districting criteria have to do with things like, well, how compact is your district? Are you keeping the city of Charlottesville and the reservation intact? And if the answer is yes, you're doing those things, as long as you're under the 10% threshold, you're okay. Now, what you might be thinking is, okay, it, didn't you just tell me that if a challenger can show, yeah, you're below 10%, but there's an illegitimate factor driving your districting, that's unconstitutional. Yes, I did. So isn't it an illegitimate factor to draw district lines in part on the basis of partisanship? Remember the bit about the Democrats taking advantage of Republicans here. Well, the answer is, no, that's perfectly legitimate. This is very surprising to people the first time they encounter election law. When you're uh, uh, older like me and bitter, this is not surprising at all. <laughs> this is part of the deal. State legislators have been gerrymandering since the beginning of our country. 
uh, we expect this, it's part of political competition, and they're permitted to do it as long as they stay within certain limits. You can't violate the substantially equal principle. Past that, they have quite a lot of uh, uh, discretion to district um, in ways that are favorable to their parties. I only have a couple minutes left, so let me talk briefly about the last case, Whitman versus Persinabala. This is a case that comes out of Virginia. So after 2010, the state legislature redrew, redrew those 11 congressional district lines, as the law requires them to do. They had to equalize populations across them. One of those districts was challenged on constitutional grounds, and a lower court found that one of those districts was an unconstitutional racial gerrymander. Um, some of you know what I'm talking about. For the rest of you, the law here is complicated. I'm not going to try in any way to explain it to you all now, but here's the 30-second version. There's a federal statute, very important, called the Voting Rights Act, that requires states, when they're drawing their district lines, to take race into account to some degree. This is with an eye towards empowering racial minorities, especially African Americans, who have systematically been disenfranchised in our country's history. So you have to take race into account to some degree, but the Constitution tells you, yeah, but don't go too far. If you take race too much into account, if you start sorting people into districts on the basis of their skin color more than anything else, well, that violates the Constitution. And a lower court said that's exactly what happened in Virginia. There's an unconstitutional racial gerrymander. Now, ordinarily, when you get this kind of holding in a lower court, the state would appeal. You would expect Virginia to try to go to the Supreme Court and say, no, no, this is not an unconstitutional racial gerrymander. Overturn that lower court and let us lines, let our state's lines stay in place. But that's not what happened here. Why? Well, when the lines were created, the state was run by a Republican administration. And after the lower court's decision, now we have a Democratic administration. And they're not so keen on those lines that the Republicans drew. They're perfectly happy to have a court say it's unconstitutional. Let's redraw them. So what happens? The state says, fine, you're right, unconstitutional, let's redraw them. But three members of Virginia's congressional delegation step in and they say, we're not cool with this. <laughs> we like the other lines. We think that they're perfectly constitutional and we would like to stand in here and defend them in the Supreme Court. Now, they lose. The Supreme Court tells these members of Virginia's congressional delegation, you don't have standing to bring this case. So some of you know what standing is, some of you haven't seen it yet. The basic idea for present purposes is you have to show some injury. You have to show how you're being harmed. And if you can't do that, the court doesn't have jurisdiction to hear your case. So in this instance, these three members of Congress from Virginia, they couldn't show how redrawing these district lines was actually going to hurt them in any obvious way. So that case was dismissed. Um, um, I'm probably out of time, so let me just say uh, quickly some things in conclusion. All three of these cases were unanimous, at least with respect to the judgment. There were only two concurring opinions, and they both came in the first case I told you about even well. One was by Justice Thomas, the other by Justice Alito. And the main, th different things to say there, but the main thrust of those was states should really be given this choice. Remember I said there's two ways to do it sustain the choice, whereas the majority opinion says, ah, you kind of have a choice, but we'll wait and see. The general message is, here the justices agree. If these were campaign finance cases and you had the 4-4 split, we would not get decisions uh, on, on anything that have binding effect, precedential effect. But at least with respect to districting, the justices agree. So I'll conclude by telling you in this uh, heated election season when polarization is, seems to be everywhere, uh, and of course people have the typical realist doubts about what motivates Supreme Court justices, the law or something else, look to the districting cases. <laughs> they agree. Maybe there's something is, there is something objective going on here. Uh, uh, and that gives me some confidence going forward. Thanks. Now, Deborah Hellman on Whole Women's Health. Sorry for coming in late. I had my seminar. Um, so actually, I'm going to talk about Whole Women's Health and also about McDonald, because I was told I could do that. But if I run out of time, you 
cut me off and I won't do McDonald. <laughs> um, <clears throat> excuse me. Okay, so Whole Woman's Health, as you'll recall, is the abortion case out of Texas. Um, dealt with a law that had two important components. The first called the admitting privileges requirement, and that was the part of the law that said that abortion providers, that doctors performing abortions have to have admitting privileges at a local hospital. And the second component of the law that was at issue was called the uh, surgical center requirement, and that basically said that uh, facilities that perform abortions have to meet the standards of a ambulatory surgical center, and suffice it to say that those were higher standards than, uh, in terms of the facility, than abortion clinics had typically met. The uh, significance of these two requirements was that they were expected to um, cut down the number of abortion providers around the state, both because um, some abortion providers would not be able to meet the surgical center requirements because those are costly, and some abortion providers would not gain admitting privileges at local hospitals. And those could be for reasons that were unconnected to competency. Some hospitals would choose not to give admitting privileges to doctors who were performing abortions. Um, what happened uh, in the procedural history of the case was that the law was struck down by the district court based on extensive factual findings about the burden that would be placed on women seeking abortions because of the closing at either clinics that had already closed or likely closings of clinics. Um, the appellate court reversed that decision and then it comes to the Supreme Court. The key issue in a way in the court is what does the undue burden standard that we know from abortion cases require. Um, so a bit of background, some of you uh, have already taken constitutional law, but in case there are any first years here who haven't taken constitutional law, I'll give you just a little background into the court's abortion cases so we can see where we're entering the discussion. Sorry, I seem to be losing my voice a little bit. Um, so at least since Roe versus Wade, uh, the court has said that a woman has a constitutionally protected right to decide for herself whether to abort uh, an early term fetus. But the court has recognized that there are two interests that the state may have that are compelling enough that would justify the state uh, infringing on that right or restricting that, that right. And those are maternal health and the state's interest in protecting maternal health and the state's interest in developing fetal life. In the original case of Roe, the court uh, set out a very rule-like, to talk about Professor Gilbert's rules versus standards, a very rule-like way to understand how those interests related to the woman's interest. And the court said that uh, pre-viability, the interests of the woman in making the decision about whether to abort her fetus, that was more important, or another way of saying that is that the state's interest in the developing fetal life did not become compelling until the point of viability. And the court said about the state's interest in protecting maternal health, that that did not become compelling until the point at which the uh, childbirth became uh, more, uh, that abortion became more dangerous than, than childbirth. So basically the court said during the first trimester because uh, abortion is safer than childbirth, the state's interest in protecting a woman's health was not sufficiently compelling, it wasn't compelling enough. And therefore those interests didn't become compelling into very, until very clear junctures. Um, skip ahead, so that's the initial case, and there's litigation about other kinds of restrictions, but the next key case is Planned Parenthood versus Casey. And in Planned Parenthood, the court reaffirmed that a woman has a constitutionally protected right to decide for herself whether to abort a non-viable fetus, but the court introduces this undue burden standard. What the court says, it, which you could say 
courts, law students, law professors have been wrestling with since then. That is, what is the undue burden standard and how does it relate to the strict scrutiny that we're more familiar with in the context of constitutionally uh, protected rights? Um, so uh, the first thing that Casey does is introduce this new standard that we're going to assess whether an abortion restriction constitutes an undue burden on a, a woman's right to choose rather than uh, using the kind of language and tests that we're for familiar with in strict scrutiny. The other important thing that Casey did was it said that the state interests in developing fetal life and in protecting maternal health, it's uh, the court said those are actually present throughout pregnancy, rather than the Roe framework, which said, no, those are interests are only compelling interests at particular junctures, that is at the end of the first trimester for a woman's health, at the point of viability for developing fetal life. That was the Roe's approach, the court says in Planned Parenthood v. Casey, that this, those interests are interests that the state can legislate in the service of from the moment of conception. Um, so they're present throughout pregnancy, and the state can try to protect those interests so long as this, what the state does to protect those interests does not put an undue burden on a woman's right to determine whether or not to continue the pregnancy. Um, OK, now we're going to jump ahead a uh, few more years, almost 20, to Gonzalez versus Carhartt which is in 2007. And this, I, you know, there are other abortion cases in between, but I'm just hitting the highlights. The court there uh, made some other significant modifications as it uh, articulated what it meant by the undue burden standard. One significant modification is it broadened the conception of maternal health. That's an interest that the state can be regulating for throughout pregnancy, and rather than considering maternal health just uh, physical health, the court also included mental health in its uh, the interest that the state can be trying to further. And the second important uh, feature of Gonzalez versus Carhartt was that the court was deferential to the legislature in assessing whether the legislation at issue, in fact, promoted the interests in maternal health that the legislation was aimed at. So uh, when a court applies strict scrutiny, it typically looks at whether there's a compelling interest and whether the law is narrowly tailored is the language the court uses, but is a tight fit, is well crafted to serving that interest. And standardly in the rationality review, which is the lowest level of scrutiny, the court just looks to see if there's a, anybody could think there was a connection between the law and the interest. And that's what we call a deferential standard of review. The court in Gonzalez versus Carhartt employs what some commentators thought looked like rationality review because it was deferential to the legislature about whether the uh, statute actually served the interest of promoting uh, maternal health. So just a few quotes from the case. The court says, it's reasonable for Congress to think that blah, 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 blah. So the idea that it's reasonable for Congress to think that something or other was connected to the end of promoting maternal health sounds like rationality review. Or another passage, the court says, while we find no reliable data to measure the phenomenon, it seems unexceptional to conclude that, etc." So those formulations sounded to many commentators like the court was not interpreting the Casey undue burden standard to be a form of heightened review that was similar to strict scrutiny, but rather to be a lower standard of review, more like uh, rationality review. Okay, enter whole woman's health. So the law purports to protect women's health by raising the requirements for the kind of facility that 
provides abortions, that's the surgical center requirement, and by requiring that physicians have admitting privileges at local hospitals in case there's some emergency, that the doctor can quickly get the woman to the hospital via the admitting privileges. And so the first question is, how is the court going to look at those uh, requirements? Is the court going to ask, it? so is the is the court going to validate the district court's approach, which looked at the factual underpinnings to see whether those requirements actually uh, furthered the interest in maternal health? Or is the court going to uh, do what the appellate court did, which looks more like what the court did in Gonzalez versus Carhartt, which is to be deferential to the legislature? It would be reasonable to think that those requirements would promote women's health. Right? Um, it would be reasonable to think that having a doctor with admitting privileges or having more requirements for the center. And the court uh, validated the district court's approach, which was to closely scrutinize whether the evidence supported the claim that these requirements, in fact, serve women's health. So the court made a strong statement that the undue burden standard is not a form of rationality review in that way, but rather looks more like a, a normal uh, strict scrutiny. Equally, or perhaps more important, is how the court understood or interpreted what you're doing when you employ this undue burden standard. One might have thought that um, in assessing whether there is a compelling interest or whether the law infringes on a fundamental right, that each of those inquiries operate like yes-no questions or on-off switches. Do you have a compelling interest or don't you? Do you have an infringement on a right or don't you? So you look for an infringement on a right, you got that. Now you look for a compelling interest, you got that. And the only thing left is to assess whether one is uh, narrowly tailored to the other, which is the part we were just discussing. Instead of doing that, viewing those inquiries as uh, yes or no questions or as on-off switches, the court instead looks at, well, how much of an infringement on the right and how much of the, how much are you promoting a woman's health? How, how it, it, yes, a woman's health is compelling, but are you promoting it a lot or a little? And if you're only infringing on the right a little, then maybe you don't have to promote the woman's health that much. But if you, or another way of saying it is if you're not promoting a woman's health very much, you can't be infringing on her right very much. That is, the court viewed those as calibrated or matched to each other, and that um, struck many people as a new way of understanding what the undue burden standard is about. That is, it, it viewed those two together in assessing whether the burden is due or undue, we see how much it's promoting women's health. So Justice Breyer, writing for the court in this opinion, joined by four other justices, so this was a 5-3 opinion. We had Breyer with Kennedy, Ginsburg, Sotomayor, and Kagan, and in dissenting we had Thomas Alito and Roberts. So Breyer's opinion, these are the passages that show you that kind of uh, balancing of the benefit and the burden, uh, he says, we conclude that neither of these provisions confers medical benefits sufficient to justify the burdens upon access that each imposes. Or a little later, when Breyer is rejecting the approach of the Court of Appeals, he says, the rule announced in Casey, however, requires that courts consider the burdens a law imposes on abortion and access together with the benefits those laws confer. So the upshot is because the law provided very little benefit, and the court saw that by scrutinizing exactly how much benefit was provided, that was the close scrutiny of the factual underpinning, because the law provided very little benefit to women's health, the court didn't allow very much of an obstacle to a woman seeking an abortion. In my view, this balancing way actually goes back to Casey. That is, once Casey said that a woman's interest, uh, the, excuse me, once Casey said that the interest in promoting, say, maternal health was present throughout pregnancy, then it had to view the interest in promoting women's health 
in this way that looked at degree. Because otherwise, if it was compelling, for sure, from the moment of conception, then it would seem to prevent any restrictions on abortion from the moment of conception. It would be compelling. And yet, Casey reaffirms a woman's right to abort a pre-viable fetus. And so it must be implicitly looking at, well, how much does it promote women's health as compared to the burden? So I think that kind of balancing uh, approach really isn't new with whole women's health, but it's much more explicitly articulated in whole women's health. Um, so the uh, upshot of the whole women's health for laws around the country is I think we're likely to see courts assess the factual underpinnings for laws that uh, are uh, for which the justification by state legislatures, let's say, the justification offered is that the regulations protect a woman's, woman's health, I think we're likely to see increased scrutiny of the factual underpinnings of those claims to see whether they, in fact, serve women's health. And then we're also likely to see the court balance the degree to which they promote women's health as against the burden that they impose on a woman's ability to choose an abortion. Um, one question that I think is left unanswered, although I don't, in fact, end up thinking it's that significant, is Casey says that um, that a court said uh, in Casey the court said that a law that imposes uh, that a law imposes an undue burden if it has and now this part is a quote the purpose or effect of placing a substantial obstacle in the path of a woman seeking an abortion. Um, We've seen the court focus on the effect prong, but not the purpose prong. So in whole women's health, the court is really saying it has the effect of placing uh, a substantial obstacle in the path of a woman seeking an abortion. But one could, at least in theory, imagine a law that doesn't place a substantial, that its effect is not to place a substantial obstacle in the path of a woman uh, seeking an abortion, but that there's evidence that it was adopted for the purpose of uh, impeding a woman's access to abortion or to uh, making fewer abortions happen. And will a court, will any court strike down a law on the basis of the what it sees as an improper purpose alone? And some people thought that the whole woman's health opinion might be grounded in part on the purpose prong. I don't read the opinion as actually grounded in that way. So that question's like left open. My own opinion is I don't think that the court will actually decide or strike down legislation on the basis of improper purpose in this area. But the Casey language leaves that point open. I think I've probably talked long enough, so I'll skip McDonald. Thanks. So I talked about what Scalia's absence meant, and we talked about the prospect of who gets to appoint the next justices. We focus too much probably on the cases where they vote in tribes. Um, they do not always vote in tribes, as Mike Gilbert emphasized in his, some of the votes in the cases Debbie talked about emphasized. Take everything they said to the bank. It's great legal analysis. One exception, don't listen to what Mike Gilbert said about the odds of your vote mattering. It's very important you vote this fall. It's a collective action problem. Um, <clears throat> and those of you who have questions should feel free to approach any of us. <laughs>